Hi everybody, <coughs> welcome to week three of Statistically Speaking. We are covering the fine topic of correlation today, and I thought it was worth saying right up front that correlation is not causation. This is something that shows up all the time in statistics. We see that people say, this mutation is, uh, is associated with this disease, and therefore it must be the cause of that disease. And that is a very, very dangerous point of view to take. So, today, in teaching you a little bit about correlation, I want to make sure that we are very careful not to say correlation is causation. That's a very dangerous place to be. So, uh, let us move straight ahead. We're going to talk about causation as an incredibly difficult thing to prove with great rigor. Um, and we'll, so we'll talk about uh, uh, it's kind of a classic set of rules that people have, have established for us to assess whether or not something is causative of another. Um, we will talk about some of the essential concepts of correlation, and from there talk a little bit about magnitudes and ranks to talk about the Pearson method for correlation versus the Spearman method for correlation. And from there we'll just kind of work through the R examples in the background. Um, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to talk a little bit about history as well because I think it's, an, it's a, an intersection that I think a lot of people don't understand about correlation. So, uh, we're going to start with Austin Bradford Hill. This is not, that's, that's the face of a man that you don't want to cross, right? He's very stern, you know? He has uh, helped to distill out some of the things that we want to prove as true before we claim causation to say A causes B, all right? So temporal relationship, temporal relationship. If A causes B, then we say A must happen before B. Now in quantum mechanics, et cetera, that's all a little messy, but just the same. Um, if your brother stomps on your foot and you start crying, it is probably appropriate to say that, you know, that he didn't uh, kick your foot in the knowledge that you would soon be crying, right? That would be sort of a nonsensical thing to say. So a temporal relationship is one of these things that we expect. Strength and dose-response relationship. Have people seen dose-response curves by chance? Uh, okay. So one of the things that we do in evaluating a drug is, is to ask whether by increasing the dosage of that drug, we also see an increase in the response that someone has to that drug. So this strength and this dose-response relationship is something uh, that we, we want to see. Um, something cannot be such a, a minor issue uh, that, that, that we claim causality from it for something that's completely disproportionate to it. Um, that's, uh, that runs a little bit afoul of things that we think about in, say, chaos theory, like the butterfly and the, and the hurricane. But, uh, but if you think about it, um, I could argue that I'm in a bad mood today because uh, my cat vomited on the carpet a week ago. Right? Presumably by now I would be over it. So in the same way we need to have some sort of proportionality between the thing that we're saying causes the, the, the response. Consistency. Um, if, you, uh, if you say that A causes B and A happens all the time and B happens only occasionally, that's a problem in that relationship. Plausibility. This is something where a lot of biomarker research falls apart. That we have a set of biological molecules that we say are good markers for someone having a disease uh, at an early stage, and yet we don't have a biological way to relate these molecules that we've claimed as biomarkers to the eventual state. Big problem. Consideration of alternate, alternate explanations. Some of the explanations that we, that we frequently use are not falsifiable. Have you heard the term falsifi falsifiable hypothesis? A hypothesis is not a good one if there's no test that could allow you to overturn your belief in that. So, um, you know, you, you might say that the flying spaghetti monster caused it to be foggy today. Um, but that's not, really, that's not really falsifiable because the flying spaghetti monster may not exist. Right? So, we need to have the ability to think about alternate explanations, that it's simply humid today and the, the dew point uh, is about where the the outside air temperature is, thus we have fog. Okay, experiment. If it is not possible to test these hypotheses uh, for, for causality, if you're not able to remove the cause and see that the effect goes away and bring back the cause and the effect returns, that's a problem. 
specificity. We've already sort of talked about that in, the con in connection with consistency. And coherence, uh, you know, obviously it all has to hang together. So uh, these are a lot of criteria, uh, and Austin Bradford, he'll put them together. Those are the things that we say give us the, the credibility to claim that A causes B. And correlation gets fouled up a lot. A lot of grad students, when making a presentation, will make the mistake of showing that when I have this variant, this, dis uh, th this disease is present, it's correlated with its appearance, therefore it must be causative. Don't make that mistake. It's one of the things that PIs love to jump all over when they discover it. Okay, so I want to give an example. Sometimes these, uh, these uh, two, two metrics fall right on top of each other, and we, and we might claim that one must be causative of the other. And so here we have the per capita consumption of margarine in the state of Maine. This is in the northeast of the United States, tied to the divorce rate in Maine. So you can see that the per capita <laughs> consumption of margarine is just under four pounds. Four pounds, I mean, that's, it's a hef, uh, that's quite a lot of margarine. And you can see that it's dropped all the way from eight pounds to four pounds over the space of a decade. And at the same time, we see that the number of divorces had fallen from 4.95 per thousand to 4.29 per thousand. You can find similar graphs like this on almost any conceivable topic, including the, uh, the, de the decrease in uh, worldwide piracy and the increase of global warming. Therefore, pirates, the, the pirates have an inverse relationship with global warming. Right, so th this is a, a great series of posts on this topic as well, so I borrowed the graphic directly from there. <clears throat> so, what is correlation? So we, we can talk about kind of these four principles associated with it. Correlation means that if you have higher A values, uh, they're associated also with higher B values. So a positive value for correlation means that the two rise together. Negative, higher A values are associated with lower B values. That's also correlation, it's just a negative correlation. Uh, a high correlation means that we observe a strong association between A and B. A low correlation coefficient means that we have a, a very little association between A and B. So the, to see a correlation value of 0.5 is not to say no correlation, it's to say it's a tepid correlation. So we think of values close to 1 or negative 1 as being strong correlations, high, a high degree of correlation. It's the values close to 0 that indicate that there's almost no relationship. <coughs> So, I have uh, produced a few graphs to give us examples of these. Um, the R code is something that I've included in, in the, the script for today. So, uh, I have an, a, a variable X and a variable Y, and here we see that these two have a... Uh, when one is up, the other is up, when the other is down, the other is down. We see that they have a strong relationship, and it's positive in that if one is up, the other is up. So that gives us a plus 9,2,4. If we uh, revert, uh, revert that relationship, we have a negative relationship. So the, when, a goes, uh, sorry, when x goes up, y goes down, we see that the, the negative correlation value there is similar in magnitude here. There, the simulation actually has them be exactly uh, related. But the correlation value that came out of this random sampling was 0.957 in the negative direction. Now what does it look like when things get fuzzier? Here we see that we've got a positive 0.63 and a negative 0.63 uh, correlation. And we see that there is, in general, a, trend, a tendency for y to grow when x grows, or here for y to shrink when x grows. And it's kind of fuzzy to think about. So when you perform correlation on your own data, you might pop out a value of, say, 0.7 and say to yourself, well, that's pretty good, right? So one of the things that you can do is produce some plots that uh, actually simulate different mixes of, of um, relationship between variables and ask, do I find those compelling when I know that the relationship is random? Right, so it, it helps us to contextualize the, co the correlation values that we get from our own data. Now, these data have absolutely no relationship between X and Y. Here, X is a, a sampling from a uniform distribution, Y is a sampling from a uniform distribution, and look, in this case, although I got a negative 0.07 correlation between the two, in this case I got a negative 0.2. There is zero actual relationship between the values of x and the values of y, but just this random sampling led to 
a, a correlation value of, of 0.2, which is the start of correlation anyway, um, even though there was no real relationship. So it is possible to get some correlation by random chance alone. So what do those functions look like? <clears throat> so I wanted to start by saying that the, the graph I used there was a multi-panel graph. Remember I had all, all six of these all, all appearing in one place? So I used, uh, you've seen me use the plot command and bar plot and histon, all of these different things. Here I'm using a parameter, a graphic parameter uh, called MF row. So I've created uh, two dimensions to it. The first is rows, the second is columns. That's actually a pretty important R concept. Frequently, we see that the dimensions that we give in, say, a matrix, the, the location within a matrix, is given with the row first and then the column. That's true here as well. So we see that I had two rows of graphics with three appearing in each, uh, in each row. Now, this is just one of the simulations that I used in the preceding slide. So A and B are, well, uh, you've seen me use runoff a few times. So runoff is, is what function? Let's separate this into two parts. We've got the R and the UNIF part. So what's UNIF? That's right, it's a uniform distribution. There's a whole family of functions all associated with uniform distribution. You've seen me use R norm. Do you remember what norm was? Normal. Normal distribution, right. Okay, now the R part of this says we want to get a random sampling drawn from a uniform distribution. What's the sporty business? Louder? The number of samples. The number of samples, exactly. Yeah, we've told the software, we want you to produce a random sample of 40 values drawn from a uniform distribution. So, RUNIF 40 for A produces a vector of, of numbers 40 long that are all random samples drawn from a uniform distribution. B is a similar, uh, similar array, but it's a, it represents a totally different set. So RUNIF is going to produce a different set of 40 numbers for A than it does for B. If I said A equals B equals RUNIF 40, what would that do? So that, that's actually kind of tricky. In that case, RUNIF is run once. It produces one vector of 40 numbers, assigns that to A, and because B is set equal to A, B becomes another copy of those same 40 numbers. But here, I'm running runoff separately. So A gets one set of 40 numbers, B gets another set of 40 numbers drawn from the same distribution, but different draws. Okay, now I did a little math here. I hope you don't mind. I know it's the run up to lunch, but we're gonna, we're gonna try to hold, uh, hold our hunger off for just a moment. I'm, I'm making a linear combination of those A and B values. So my X value is 0.6 times A plus 0.4 times b. So x is also going to be distributed from 0 to 1, just like those values from RUNIF are. But it's going to be shaded towards a slightly greater weight on a than on b. x is going to be slightly heavier weighted on b than on a. Do you see that? So these, these two uniform distributions are getting combined in a way that shades uh, more towards the first vector in one case and more towards the second vector in the other case. But it's a linear combination of the two. All right, and then I simply plot x versus y. I give myself a, a, a label across the top of the graph, positive high correlation, and then I run the correlation function itself, which in R is very straightforward, core. Right? So I can just say core of x comma y, it will tell me what the correlation value is for those two. <coughs> So in the, in the preceding slide, all I've done is to uh, do four, sorry, six, six such plots, telling it in the first case that I wanted a 0 0.6 and a 0 0.4, and in the second case, a, 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 a 0 0.4 and a 0 0.6 for, for the, X, uh, the two x and y variables, and then plot them. In this case, I had to invert the y-axis. So I did something very simple. I, I just subtracted the value of y from one in each case. We'll look at the R code and we'll try to walk through how that works. Over here, I just did two, I made X and Y direct uh, random samples from the uniform distribution. Here, I changed the mixing 
You remember I had the 0.6 and 0.4 weights on the X ratio. What I did was to push those further apart so that they were, uh, the values of, of X represented were, were less similar to the values of Y. We can look at the R code in a minute. Okay. Now, a little bit of history. There, there are two principal kinds of, of regression, uh, uh, sorry, of, of correlation uh, that I'll be talking about today. Pearson and Spearman. And I would really like you to know the difference between those because both of them are available to us and they have different strengths and weaknesses. But I wanted to spend a little bit of time on the history of these guys. So this is Karl Popper. Um, he's one of those big forehead people. Sometimes they're just like that. Pearson created a, a version of, of uh, correlation that depends on magnitude, okay? So it is a, it is a, a parametric assessment. It, it sort of assumes something like normalcy of the data, et cetera. Um, it represents the covariance divided by the product of the, uh, of the standard deviations. So standard deviation is kind of a, a normal distribution kind of concept. We see that it's included right here in the expression. So covariance is a measure of how much two numbers vary together, uh, two random variables vary together. It's similar to variance, but where variance tells you how a single variable varies, you know, is it wide, is it skinny? Um, covariance tells you how two variables vary together. So this is a, a description I've drawn directly from statistics how to. Now, um, Carl Pearson is a, a curious fellow. Um, like many people in the early 20th century, he was a eugenicist. Have you heard of this term before? Ah, okay. Well, eugenics people, well, I, I guess what I would say is in the 20th century, humanity learned an awful lot about what it costs to believe that people are superior to other people. I think we would all agree that World War II was a pretty scarring experience for everyone. So, in the early 20th century, there were a lot of people playing around with the idea of, uh, of self-justification, I suppose. So, you could say that a person waking up one day, discovering himself or herself filthy rich, living on top of the world, could say, uh, it is by random chance that I turned out to be rich and wealthy and powerful. Right? However, that is not what most people in the world have done when they've become rich and powerful. <coughs> they have generally said, I deserve to be rich and powerful because of who I am. And a lot of people have taken it to the opposite extreme, especially in the early 20th century, when they said, uh, it's, it's not just that some people are better than other people. Some people are better than others because of the, the color of their skin, because of their religion, because of their intelligence, because of any number of other things. And so when we look at the history of psychology practice in the first, 20th century, first part of the 20th century, you see a lot of people practicing something called social Darwinism, which is this belief that the rich and wealthy are rich and wealthy, be, this, rich and powerful are, are so because of something innate in them. And you saw people going in all kinds of directions to try to tell the story. They would measure skull shape, something called phrenology, to say that uh, my skull shape shows that I am destined to become a murderer, or my skull shape shows that I am destined to be rich and powerful. Right? This is called phrenology. The eugenics people were, were social Darwinists of this type who believed that, uh, that there was something innate in us which spelled out our abilities. So, Karl Popper, uh, Karl Pearson, sorry, uh, not Karl Popper, was, was uh, one of these folks. I, I have a, a little quote I wanted to read. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to just slam him without uh, contextualizing <laughs> it, but <clears throat> I found this little link. Oh, I'm sorry, it only shows on my screen. That's okay, it's very small anyway. Um, in, in his book, The Problem of Practical Eugenics, uh, Karl Pearson wrote, is devoted to arguing that the reform of child labor laws has made children into an economic and social burden to parents and society. Calling for a repeal of child labor laws and, and work laws, he states that practical eugenics demands in the first place that the economic value of the child shall be restored to pre-regulation status. Right? So, he argues that poor people have too many kids 
and that's really bad for society, therefore we should at least make them work for their livings. Right. Carl Pearson. So this, this was a, 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 one of the most influential thinkers in the world of biostatistics, but let us remember that frequently he used those statistics in a way that we find reprehensible, just to put one word on it. Okay. When, when people talk about decolonizing education, I hope that this is one of the things that they remember, that <laughs> these people have histories, they're verifiable histories, you can look them up and learn something, uh, learn what not to do along with what to do. I don't want to, just because I'm going to be talking about Pearson's name a lot of times, I don't want you to think that he was a brilliant, flawless person, because he certainly wasn't. All right, so, Carl Pearson, on we go. Let us talk about the next person, Spearman, Charles Spearman. Uh, the, the first skeleton I found in his closet was, was not much of a skeleton at all. He's, he's actually one of the originators of the idea of IQ. IQ has been used badly, but he, he held that, uh, that there were lots of different tests out there to judge whether you could recognize patterns, uh, to judge whether you could remember things, to judge whether you could work through logic puzzles. He argued that all of these were outgrowths of the same concept of, of this value he called G, a general intelligence factor. He was one of the inventors of factor analysis for that purpose. So uh, here we see that uh, we've got another value. Instead of uh, creating a value called R, we have one called Rho. I know it looks like a P. It's not. It's a Greek letter, Rho. <coughs> so Rho is equal to the covariance of the ranks of X and the ranks of Y divided by the standard deviation of the ranks. So this is different. If I have the values... 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. The 16 on a, on a magnitude scale, like in a Pearson, is 16 times the value of the smallest value in that series, 1. If I look at those in ranks, their ranks would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I had 5 values, right? 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. All right. So you can think of these, the, you can think of those as, as, magnitudes in the first case, the 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and the ranks, how high they fell within the, that particular list on the other scale. Which means that here, we only care about the order of their, of their intensities. We don't care about their magnitudes within that series. All right, so if we do that, um, we care, we're, we're building our correlation on how these values rank within the series, within a pair of series, in fact, not about just their magnitudes. And one of the very powerful things that comes about is that this is very robust against outliers. Now, before anyone starts uh, saying that I'm glorifying uh, Pearson, of uh, 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 reviling Pearson and, and claiming Spearman is brilliant, I want to read you something that Spearman wrote in his career. <clears throat> all right. Uh, all right. Oh, I just had here. Uh, so, as I mentioned, he was an innovator in uh, defining the term general intelligence, and now we're going to read how he thought that would be useful. He expressed his eugenic opinions in a more hard-boiled fashion than ever did Dalton himself, writing in 1912, for example, quote, one can conceive the establishment of a minimum index of general intelligence here to qualify for parliamentary vote, <laughs> and above all, for the right to have offspring. <laughs> so let us imagine that in getting married or petitioning for the right to raise your own child, you had to prove you had the intelligence to do so. The eugenicists went much further than this, frankly. In, in many cases, people with, uh, with relatively low general intelligence were sometimes sentenced by the courts to, uh, to be sterilized lest they taint the genetic pool. So this went really, really far. You, if you keep going in that direction, you eventually get Nazis, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Right, so where, where did these ideas come from? By respectable scientists, they, these people had been respected for a very long time, misapplying their ideas pretty significantly, all right? So rank-based correlations, and magnitude-based correlations come from some people with really strong ties to the world of eugenics, which led really strongly to some of the, the greatest mistakes of the 20th century. All right. 
you thought you were going to learn some statistics today oh. instead of dragging you through history. <laughs> All right, so um, I wanted to point out that these two measures of correlation give very different appreciations of the same values. So here, I am using a cosine function. So x ranges from 0 to 3, uh, 0 to pi in this case, actually. Uh, and then the y value is the cosine of x. So clearly, these, these two values are related to each other. In fact, they're an exact function of each other. Uh, this is different than the examples I used before, where both x and y were built from some combination of a and b uh, random vectors. So I've, I've got my random x values, and for each one I've computed the cosine. Remember, cosine starts at 1 when you're at 0, and then it falls to, uh, to negative 1 when you hit pi. So, all right, so if I run the Pearson, uh, I see that my correlation function also lets me put in a method alongside that. So if I provide it the Pearson, lower cap, uh, low, lower case, it will give me a negative 992 correlation. So this is, that, that seems appropriate, right? If, you, if I were just to throw a line through this, I would see that these points all fall pretty close to that line. Now I could have used a function that was more sigmoidal, that was stretched this way, and then we would have seen a slightly different uh, uh, value here. But I want to point out that correlation is only finding linear relationships between these two vectors. So here we see that it's negative 99 shows a high degree of correspondence between x and y on this line and that it's a negatively sloped. When I give it to the Spearman correlation, however, it sees a perfect correlation between the two values. So why would that be, why would that be true in this case? Why is it a perfect correlation? I want to give you another vocabulary term. I didn't throw it on the slide, but it's worth knowing. It's called monotonic. Monotonic. Okay? A monotonic function always rises or always falls. So in this case, as x increases, y always, always decreases. Therefore, the rank of earlier values by x will always have higher values by y. So that's why it's a perfect Spearman correlation it doesn't care about the magnitudes and the distribution. It cares that they're both monotonic and that as x, all, as x rises, y always rises. Okay, so two different correlation functions applied to the same data give different correlation metrics, rho and r. Okay, now resisting outliers. Now I have to be a little funky here. I'm going to try to parse through the, uh, the code a little bit. So I start with Two, uh, two vectors, 10 items long. So 10 A values, 10 B values, both uniformly distributed. Now I still have that bit where I'm weighting the two vectors against each other. You can see that X puts a slightly stronger emphasis on A, 55% versus 45%. Y puts a slightly stronger emphasis on, y, on uh, B than on A, 55% versus 45%. But I've added two other data points into these vectors as well. Right, so that this part, this second line of each of these codes, is putting in 10 points in the vector, but I'm adding two others. So in x, I add the value 2 uh, at, with a, a vertical value of 0.7. See that point way up there? This is my outlier that I've added. It's got a coordinate of 2, comma, 0.7. And then I have another value here at minus 1 and 0.1. See that? So those are added second, point one, uh, sorry, minus 1 and point 0.1. So I've, I've forced two outliers into what is otherwise a pretty strongly linear function. What's that? Oh, I thought I said something funny. No. <laughs> sorry. I need to be taller to point to my data points. I know that much. Okay. Well, so, so what we have then are two outliers that have been shoved into a simulated strong correlation. When I feed this to the Pearson correlation function, it's really frustrated by the fact that it's got these two strong outliers. And you can see that the correlation value that results from it, around 0.75, is actually punishing what is a strong, a strong correlation because of those two outlier data points. When I give it to Spearman, on the other hand, it loves these data. It says, oh, this is a great correlation. So if you see a big deviation 
between the Spearman and Pearson methods for the same data set, you should probably ask yourself, what points are forcing Pearson to give me a higher value? Or sorry, a lower value, I should say. Okay, so that's the, uh, the set. So, correlation analysis lets us compare the values between two sets for some sort of association for a covariance. The two sets are treated as independent of each other. Neither is expected, it is modeled as a function of the other. I, I was trying to be really careful of that, except in the case of the cosine, where they were both drawn from different weightings of two input variables. The non-parametric Spearman correlation method is preferable when your data contain outliers. And probably the other lesson is if you want to believe firmly in the, if you want to defend your faith in humanity, don't look too closely into the histories of the people who invented this field of statistics. I think that's the other thing to, to, to think about. Okay, so with that, you should have R installed on your laptop. You should have your laptop with you, hopefully. Um, we have a few examples uh, that we might want to work through. I'm going to uh, close these slides for now. Okay. So, um, oh, the slides show is still running. There we go. Okay. So these data should be found in the statistically speaking shared folder. I uploaded this one just a moment ago with, with some updates there. Now I'm going to open R. Here's my R. Oh, I had some nonsense there. Okay, off screen. And I've got uh, my script right here. Now I'm going to just sort of work my way down here. Um, this code, this, this line, this par function, is uh, something that I mentioned beforehand. It allows me to make multiple panel graphs. In this case, three columns, two rows. I just wanted to note that I can... Uh, I, let me uh, recreate my... Uh, I'm just going to say uh, x is a sample of a thousand, ten thousand, let's say, points drawn from a normal distribution. So if I want to create a plot of that, well, I'll just do a histogram of x for now. Okay. So if I want to, uh, if I want to output an image of that. I could just screenshot what I have here, or I could tell it to export that. So I, I, I thought it might be valuable to talk about some of the ways that we do that. So one of the easiest things to do is that I might want to create a PDF file. PDF file equals um, norm dot PDF. Is that a good name? I won't do that. Okay. This is not part of the script. I'm just, I'm just talking about this because it's a useful thing to know. So I'm going to have it create a, a PDF file from what comes next. Okay, and now I'm going to say histogram of X. I don't see anything happening. I mean, that, that, that image that I have on screen is just an old one. And now I want it to finish writing that file. I want that to be the only thing written to the file. So I'm going to tell it to turn that device off. All right. So I created an output a display, a, 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 basically told it to write what comes next to this output file in PDF format. I told it to create a histogram, and then I told it to turn that device off. Okay. So what happened as a result of that? I have my, uh, I didn't tell it what directory to write to, and so it wrote to the, uh, the, the, the documents directory inside my user account. Now that's going to be a little different probably on, on, uh, between Windows and Mac or Linux, but it's got some basic directory. And remember, if you want to say, uh, what, what is my current, what, what is my, uh, what files are currently visible, I can say list files like that. And I see, ah, yeah, that's in the, and I know where that is, that's my documents. Okay, so here's norm PDF. It just wrote this file and finished it with a dev off command. If I open it, oops, oh, if I open that, I see that I got a PDF out. Now that PDF is that, if I remember correctly, is six inches wide and six inches tall. You can change that uh, when you create the PDF document by specifying a width and a height. 
You can even, I think, specify that you want to use A4 paper rather than inches because who's American here, right? <laughs> so there you go. <clears throat> so this is how you can create output files. Have you heard of PNG files? PNG, oh good, several people have. Okay, so uh, a PNG is a, an open image format for storing still images. So if you wanted to write this to a PDF, you're, you're free to do that, but maybe you're heading for uh, a, a, a document you're gonna show on a web page. So a PNG is a good format for that. Maybe you want to write to a vector format, um, like something you're going to blow up really huge on a poster. You might do that by SVG, or you might do it by EMF. EMF is a little harder to do. But all of those have their own way to create a drawing object. So PDF, PNG, I don't think there's a GIF writer, but once you've got a PNG, that's not hard to get to. Um, so these are, this is an example of how you would create an output for this. <clears throat> if you wanted to subdivide that PNG or that PDF or whatever into a, a three by two um, uh, drawing, uh, set of drawings, what you do is run that par command. Okay. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to return to just doing this on screen, if that's all right. Uh, all right, I'm going, to sit, I'm going to turn off my current visualization over there. And now I'm going to run that par up here. There we go. So it's now created an, an, an active, uh, active drawing window. <clears throat> now, in, I, I've already told it how I want this formatted. Three columns, two rows. Now I'm going to create uh, several plots to, to work with. I'm going to just say uh, histogram R norm 10,000. Just like that. You see that? <clears throat> Now it's not taking up the full space, and the reason it's not taking up the full space is that I've told it I've got two more columns coming and, and one more row coming. So this par MF row business set up this formatting for us. Now I'm going to rerun that hist command, and you see it popped right into place next to it. So there's a filling order going on here too. By default, the software assumes I'm going to give it the, the images in row order. So I'm going to fill the first row with three plots, then the second row with three plots. And maybe just for diversity, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the second row look different. Plot density, our norm, 10,000. Need one more. Okay. So now, Instead of creating histograms, I'm plotting density plots in alongside them. Okay, so hopefully that discussion added a couple things for you. One is that I don't have to just create images on screen. I can create them as output files, PNGs, or PDFs using the PNG command or the PDF command. Um, hopefully you saw that uh, you can change the software's expectation of how many images should be composited together using the, the MF row parameter. And you, you can see how you then subsequently add those images to build up a complex one. Anyone lost so far? OK, great. So um, now to return to the script, I, I realize I, I kind of went pretty far on that first one. Here, I'm, I'm going to just add in this bit of code here, file equals um, my PDF dot PDF with equals a height equals four, five, say. There we go. I need to plot something here. Uh, plot our norm. Uh, sorry, I'm going to do a histogram. Histogram our norm ten thousand. And then I have to say dev off to reflect that I want it to go ahead and finish that file off. If you try to view the PDF file before you run device off, you'll probably get a, an incomplete file. It probably won't render correctly. So you really do have to tell it, I'm now done rendering to this. All right, someone's going to ask me this question now. 
Dave, you just told me how to, how to create a, a six panel figure, but what you didn't explain is what happens if I give it something other than six panels to put in there. So what if I create something the, the same way with my, my MF row two comma three business, but I give it eight plus instead of six, what happens? It adds a second page. So if you're writing a PDF document, having defined this plot once, if you feed it 25 plots, having structured it this way, it'll keep going through six pages that are all full, and then one page that's got one plot in it. So R is actually pretty flexible. It's like, well, you're going to give me more plot plots, I'm going to give you more pages. All right, grand. So uh, I, I said that I was going to explain how these, uh, how these uh, x and y values came about. This was my high correlation example. We already talked about that one on screen. Uh, I mentioned that I used a negative correlation by subtracting from 1. So you can see that y equals, uh, that, that these two plots in the first, the first and second high correlation plots are exactly the same in code, except that in the second case I say y equals 1 minus blah blah blah. The, the numbers that changed and why the correlation value was slightly different just came from random sampling alone. Okay, my no correlation plots, they're pretty obvious, I think. I drew uh, 40 random samples for x, 40 random samples for y. I plotted them, I ran the correlation function. My low correlation values here are pretty straightforward as well in that I've uh, changed my weights from 0.6 and 0.4 for weighting to something further apart. So now I have a 0.7 and a 0.3 weighting, which means that Although uh, X and Y are both derived from A and B, it just puts a, drives those weights further apart, so they have less similarity between their values. Okay. Now, uh, I gave the example of uh, my, uh, my cosine values. Here you can see that the software already knows what the value of pi is. If I know the uh, if I know the diameter of a circle, and I want to know the length of its circumference, what do I do? The diameter is the, the longest chord across the circle. All right, so I know the length of that, that's D, but I want to know how long the circumference is. Anyone remember? Ah, it's multiplied by pi. Yeah. Multiply by pi. So pi is, uh, if I want to know the area of the circle and I know half its diameter, its radius, what's that? <coughs> pi r squared. Pi r squared, great, okay, good. So you guys remember some trig geometry, that's cool. Great, so um, in this case, I was computing cosine, so I wanted to have the value of pi be my maximum, which is half of the whole cycle of cosine. Cosine starts at one, it drops down to minus one as you get to pi. So that's why I set up the, the range like that. Okay, so as we move ahead, we talked about the outlier problem. Here we see this is exactly the code I used to add on those two outlier points. So I already had a chain of 10 values. I added on two more manually. So I would rerun this code and I would get a different correlation value out. That would be because these, these random samples changed slightly. But the two outliers are fixed in space because I define them manually. And to get the two correlation values out, I do have to inform cor the correlation function that I want to use Pearson versus Spearman uh, as the method. Oh, uh, there are, the other key thing I want to make sure you guys got today, not just the formatting thing, uh, was uh, that there are sample data included with many packages out there. One of the most commonly used ones is a, uh, a botanist's collection of, of measurements on a bunch of irises. So we're going to uh, use this code down here at the bottom. This was the part that I added earlier today uh, to do that. So I'm going to return to R here. Uh, I'm actually going to close my plot, I think. There we go. Now I'm going to just run that code directly. Okay. So I started with the statement data iris. So data, uh, this very first line, data parentheses iris. Iris is this botanist's collection. What's my favorite command ever for figuring out what, what data look like? All right. 
It's, I'm, I'm, I'm typing in the wrong place. There we go. The summary command is my very, very favorite, and it really works better when you give it more screen real estate to work with. Oh, what am I doing? Let me rerun that. Summary of Iris. <clears throat> so the Iris data set has 150 data points spanning three different species of iris. You see that in each case I get the minimum, the first quartile, the median, third quartile, maximum, and the mean. Those are the spread statistics that we spent so much time talking about last week. So when we look at these data, we see that we have uh, a, a fair number of values to work from. You might expect, this is, this is the critical bit that I want you to take home on the, on the iris data set. You might expect that a flower with longer petals also has wider petals. You see that? You, you assume that there's a similar shape to these things, that they're not all stretched out when they get long. So I think that petal length and petal width should be correlated. So we can check that. <clears throat> oh, I need to be careful about this. I, I don't want to just rock it ahead on this. This is an example of something we call a data frame. We saw an example of it last week when I loaded that spreadsheet into memory, but here we've got a more complex structure. We have different fields, one, two, three, four, five fields. The first one, second one, third one, and fourth one are all numeric, just numeric. They have no not applicable values. They're com it's a complete table for all four of those values. But species is different. You see, it's not giving us a minimum or a maximum or a mean or anything. It's giving us something we call a factor, a factor. And you can show individual fields from these data frames by specifying that after a dollar sign on, I, on iris. So I'm, I want to look at iris species. So I'm using that dollar sign species to indicate just that. And one of the things that we discover is that this data set has been sorted for us. We had 50 values of Setosa, 50 values of Versicolor, and 50 values of Virginica. And down at the bottom, it's giving us a list of how many distinct terms there are. This is one of the key attributes of a factor. So we see that there are three values, each appearing 50 times. We can also, let me return to my summary, we can also look at individual numeric fields in this way. So if I want to look at all of the sepal width values, I can say iris, dollar sign, sepal width, boom, out that pops. Okay. So uh, I had a, a correlation hypothesis a moment ago in that I said I think longer petals are also wider. And so here we are doing a correlation between two different fields of one data table. All right. So I've, I've told it to create a plot of the two that appeared on a different, a different a panel behind this one. And I ran the correlation between the length and width of the petals. And we see a really strong positive correlation. Would you expect it to be positive or negative? Positive. We would expect it to be positive in this case because if it gets wider, we also think it gets longer. It is possible that you know if you had a, a world in which petals had a fixed amount of material and it could either be long or wide, you'd see an inverse correlation. But in this case, longer and wider go hand in hand. So a high positive correlation is what we would expect in this case. And if we look at the data, because I made the plot as well, we get kind of a mixed story. Now I, I want to point out that what I've done is to force R to compare petal length, length and width across all 150 rows of this table. I didn't specify I want just the versicolors or just the setosas or just the virginicas. As a result, it's glommed them all together, even though one of these iris species is way out separated from the others. So we'll be talking about stuff like that in another, in another lecture. But for now, I hope that you feel um, you, you have more information than you did before about the founders of correlation metrics, that you know how to create output files from R rather than simply creating just plots on the screen, and that you have some notion of 
how you would grab out a particular field of a data frame, iris being an example of that. Okay, well, with that said, I think we're all done with Statistically Speaking for the week, and I will look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you.